So that's um, the idea, that's the program for today and we are coming to the uh, presentations, to the six highlight talks um, we have selected today. And the first speaker in that session is uh, Ronnie Röwert. He's coming from Hamburg, Hamburg University of Technology. I Now he's there. Hi, Ronnie. Um, I guess you are in Hamburg, aren't you? Good morning, Klaus. Yes, I'm uh, in Hamburg, but south uh, of the Elbe in Harburg. Okay. in Ham Oh, yeah. Hamburg, Harburg. Yeah, that's south of the Elbe. Very true. So um, his presentation has the title, What Drives Open Science Pioneers? And um, it's based on evidence from Open Science Award winners. Um, Ronnie is a research associate in at the Institute for Technical Education and Higher Education at the um, uh, University of Technology in Hamburg. Um, in his doctoral project, in his PhD thesis, he is investigating motives, incentives and influencing factors for the anchoring of open science practices. Ronnie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, um, Klaus Tochtermann, and um, also for the opportunity to present at this year's Open Science Conference. Um, as it was said in the introduction, I'm concerned with the question of how it can be explained that despite very conclusive reasons we already discussed during the last couple of days for Open Science, on the one hand, there are scientists who remain unimpressed with the research practices. And on the other hand, we see scientists who have been opening up the research more and more in recent years. In my presentation today, I do not want to talk about um, in the, the, the scientists who, that, that do not um, practice open science. So I do not want to talk about reasons that prevent open science practices, but rather about the reasons that lead individual scientists to establish the idea of open science. My talk today is not about those scientists testing open science a bit here and there, but the pioneering scientists who have even received an award for their open science activities. Many presentations and publications on the topic of open science often begin with overarching reasons for why open science makes sense. And as Klaus Tochtermann said, why open science should be the new normal. As shown by Asa and Fersodi in a systematizing literature review, these justifications for open science can be grouped into the following three types of arguments. In terms of science policy, we expect open science to democratize scientific knowledge and make it more accessible. We also hope that open science um, will enable us to better respond to societal challenges and needs. Furthermore, we hope to increase the efficiency of research by avoiding duplication of work and more effective collaboration among scientists. But are these also the same reasons that make scientists apply open science to their own research practice and integrate it in their daily work? The aim of my PhD project is to shed light on this. To get a feeling for the status quo of the implementation of the idea of open science in today's research culture, it helps to take an exemplary look at the establishment of, in this case, open data practices. Here you can see the results of the latest large scale survey among scientists in various disciplines in Germany on their open data attitudes and practices. The green dots on the right side show the approval of open data depending on the various disciplines on average around 80%. The blue dots on the left side show the actual own sharing practice with regard to open data on average slightly below 50%. We already know when it comes to science on open science, we already know a lot about the attitudes of scientists towards open science. We also know a lot about the difference between claim and reality. Yet very little is known about the concrete motivation of scientists in their context conditions when it comes to the practical implementation of open science. 
That is why in my PhD project, I asked the question, what motives are at work in embedding open science practices? Since scientists do not necessarily know their motives themselves, or there can be a bias due to socially desirable um, response behavior, I use qualitative in-depth interviews with a mixture of narrative interviews and visual methods, such as value map mapping. For this purpose, I conducted a full survey among scientists with an Open Science Award in Germany. The transcripts will be published as open data later this year. Based on the interviews conducted with the Open Science Award winners, a total of 14 central motifs could be reconstructed. Only motifs that are found in at least two of the scientists interviews and thus have generalizable potential were included. These motives can be divided into three clusters, different clusters than I showed before. Firstly, there are the advantages of open science for the scientific community. There's a motif that research results can be reused. We talked about this at this year's conference quite a lot. Secondly, a culture of sharing should increase the efficiency of research. In addition, the desire for stronger interdisciplinarity and collaboration is a driving force. The credibility of one's own research and that of uh, one's colleagues in the sense of reproduci reproducibility and replicability is also a strong motive. They also hope for new quality standards to work for their own research work and that of their colleagues. Another cluster of motives is the overarching, so are the overarching societal reasons for open science. Firstly, this is the easier global accessibility of research results, especially for researchers with weak resources. Another motive is the participation of the public and thus taxpayers um, as funders of research. In addition, within the cluster, the researchers interviewed also would also like to see stronger networking and cooperation between research and society. The third and last cluster is made up of motives that bring particular benefit from open science for the individual researcher. In comparison to the rather altruistic um, motives mentioned so far, one could also speak of more egoistic motives. On the one hand, this is the feeling of belonging to a pioneering community of scientists. On the other hand, it is to fill one's own research work with meaning and impact. In addition to these rather soft motives, there are also rather straightforward motives such as greater recognition of one's own research. Some researchers want to distinguish themselves through open science aspects in their work when it comes to career development. Another motive is the citation advantage of open access publications, open data, and other formats, also as mentioned by Klaus Tochtermann in this introduction. These are the motives that could be reconstructed on the basis of my interviews with the Open Science Award winners. Now the overarching question is which of these motives and to what degree drive the award winners as pioneers of open science? For this purpose, the real I showed before can be filled from the inside out, depending on the frequency the motive is mentioned. Reuse as a motive, you see it at the top, reuse as a motive was mentioned by most of the researchers, eight in total. Other reasons such as profiling, quality assurance, etc., were only mentioned two times. The results show a spread of motives across the three clusters I explained. Reuse was the most frequent most motive citation advantage at the top, the second, and the public interest you see in the bottom as a third central motive. This overview shows um, how this manifests itself individually. In the columns are the interviews with discipline abbreviations, and on the left, you see the motives. All interviewees are always driven by, by motives that consist of at least three individual motives, you see in the case of the engineering scientist, and are distributed 
at least two at at least two of the motif clusters. From here on, it can be concluded that a broad spectrum of motifs is individually decisive for the implementation of the idea of open science, and that neither altruistic nor egoistic motifs alone are decisive. Here I presented some results of my PhD study in a very condensed form. The selected results are intended to help decision makers in the field of open science, especially with regard to the following three takeaway messages for the implementation of open science on a political and institutional level. First, independent of infrastructures and policies as enablers of open science, as we heard also in previous talks. It is always individual scientists who practice and perform the general idea of open science in a very concrete way at their desks and at, in their labs. This always requires very individual drivers and an individual mix of personal motives, as I showed before. Second, in the literature, Egoistic versus altruistic motives are often discussed as pairs of opposites for the motivation of scientists in general and with regard to open science in particular. My empirical res um, results rather show a completely different picture. Egoistic and altruistic motives rather go hand in hand and are not opposites. Third point, the most comprehensive policies and strategies for open science must always have a very good science fit and must not only be based on arguments on a very abstract level, as I showed in the beginning, but must always be, be linked to the local discipline specific and individual motives and incentives of scientists. If this is not the case, the adapted Minsberg statement applies research culture eats open science strategy for breakfast. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present my empirical results, and I look forward to the further discussion, either here or bilaterally afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie. Thank you for sharing your insights uh, with us. Um, I would like to invite all participants um, uh, to uh, use Slido, to the interaction tool, to uh, post their questions. Let me start um, with a question um, I have. So um, you are conducting research in open science about motives for open science practices, but you are a research associate at the Institute for Technical Education and Higher Education, meaning that your PhD thesis will be a disciplinary thesis in the field of the Institute, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. So where, where would you publish? I mean, if you, I mean, for us, for our community, that's of imp greatest importance to, to hear what you have investigated. But um, uh, as far as I know, there is no like, um, uh, you know, no, no disciplinary open science journal. So would your uh, discipline accept publications um, uh, with the topics you have presented here? Very good question. Maybe we can talk about the idea of a, a specific open science research uh, journal uh, on, a, on a different time. It is, it is the case, as you mentioned. So I would rather um, try to get into other like discourses where I can easily um, dig in. That means, for example, it's the whole context as uh, digital transformation of um, higher education. So this conference has been named Science 2.0 now from to Open Open Science Conference, and there is I think there is still a discourse how did the digital transformation really shapes universities and higher education institutions? And for example, this is like a publication opportunity. Um, another point is like I'm, I have like a sociological approach and of course it's like disciplines um, with theories that are adapted where I can uh, publish but it's it's completely right we maybe it should be we, we are at a stage when it comes to um, science on open science mm. where we are able to have central central places where our yeah. research can be published good point thank you very much we have uh, questions from the auditorium and I would like, yeah, there is one. Um, we can all read it. Are you also doing a follow-up interview or study on the open science performance of the interviewees? 
Very good point. So from every PhD uh, study, at least uh, another five um, ideas for another PhD studies come out. It's hard to, to just do one PhD study, actually, when you're really into the field. Um, I think there are excellent uh, windows of opportunity if you use the science and technology studies research agenda. That means really uh, like it, it has been carried out at CERN, where researchers on research really go to the labs, go to the to the research groups, go to the desk and kind of shadowing what researchers are doing to get a practical feeling of what is done. And I think this is a great uh, suggestion. So far, like I, I, I chose the award winners and I really hope that the, the juries selected those who are also practically like practically um, doing open science and a level and um, yeah thanks okay we have another question uh, last one before we continue here it is uh, we can all read it you concluded with research strategy eats open science culture for breakfast can you give an example for this yeah I really think that um, if I look at my own university and then when it comes to training and convincing young early career researchers to also um, adapt the idea of open science, very broad um, like arguments um, come up and also there is no concrete hint why it exactly can benefit your, your research in your research phase, for example, in the phase of um, early career researchers. So I think that institutions, for example, though they have a nice strategy, they should really care about how can we go down to the faculties and make it make it work and also find arguments, for example, for my target group of early career researchers, why I should um, come to the Open Science Conference, look for ideas and implement it in my research. Thank you very much. I fully support that. My recommendation for each scientific institution would indeed be develop your own open science policy um, uh, to provide guidance to the early stage um, scientists on how they should uh, position themselves with respect to open science. Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie. That was a great um, opening for this session. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks. We continue with the next uh, speaker coming from the University of Sheffield. It's uh, Giran Koklun Lee. He will be uh, talking about um, how the pandemic has widened the gen gender gap in research productivity in academia. So that's another um, presentation which um, uh, well uh, provides insights into uh, how the pandemic and how the lockdowns during that time influenced um, the working practices, the scientific processes of a, a certain uh, a researcher, which is Kiran. I hope he's already there. There he is. Hi, Kiran. Good to see you. You are in Sheffield at this point in time? Hi, yes. You are in Sheffield. Okay. So Kiran uh, comes from the field of biology. Again, not a faculty of open science because these faculties do not exist at this point in time, but from uh, um, uh, biology. Uh, he is currently working on his PhD at the University of Sheffield. And um, his master thesis was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, he was suddenly in a situation in which he could not rely on lab work field work or in-person supervisions, which apparently is important to your field of um, research, um, Kiran. So during this period, you learned, you experienced how open science practices can um, help in such situation. And we are looking forward to your presentation, Kiran. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, this is research for from my master's, uh, as you said. Um, it's a big collaborative venture between myself, Adele, Dita, Hannah, and Antitia from these respective institutions. And um, our research can be found in this QR code, which links to our preprint, pre -print, which is soon to be published. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk about our research on the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the gender gap in academic productivity. Um, so we conducted this research because women are currently underrepresented in academia. 
and we need more diversity in academia for it to flourish and to produce better research. Um, and this underrepresentation of women is often conceptualized as this sort of leaky pipeline. So if we imagine academics that sort of flow through this pipeline, it sort of leaks such that women become underrepresented further up the career ladder. So we start with sort of like an equal distribution of women and um, men in academia, and this falls later on in the career ladder. Um, and one of the ways um, this leaky pipeline occurs is because we often measure um, academic performance using research productivity. So often that's using the number of publications or submissions. But the number of publications and submissions, so research productivity, is often subject to socio-demographic factors. And for women, these factors, there are factors which impact research productivity. Uh, such factors can be sort of grouped into home place factors and factors which happen in, the ac in academia. So women are often tasked with a lot of care and domestic work in the home place. And this leads to reduced research productivity. During the pandemic, because of the lockdown conditions, there was less access to, for example, schools, um, childminding services, domestic services. Uh, women couldn't rely on the extended family for support. And so it's likely that this might have reduced the relative research productivity of women during the pandemic. Also in academia, women are often tasked with so-called non-promotable tasks. So things which don't directly correspond to productivity in terms of research output. So often these tasks are sort of administrative or organizational. And if you think about during the lockdown conditions of the pandemic, there would have been a lot of oversight and administration and organization um, needed to make a functional working environment in academia. So combined, it's potentially likely that the pandemic may have worsened academia's gender gap, especially in research productivity. And we studied this by conducting a literature review and meta-analysis um, by entering our search terms, looking for studies which investigated the effects of the pandemic. So comparing during the pandemic and before the pandemic, the, um, the gender gap in research productivity. And in four databases, you can see our Prisma flow diagram here. We generated 55 studies and 130 effect sizes, which looked at this effect. And overall, from these 130 effect sizes, we found a 7% gender gap increase in research productivity. So all 130 effect sizes here in this orchard plot are displayed as circles with the size of the circle corresponding to their position. So more precise studies have a larger circle. And the mean effect is here in this square bold, um, in this bold square, um, which lies at around zero, minus 0 0.07. There are caveats to our general um, overall effect because we basically assume gender as a binary variable. It doesn't capture the full spectrum of gender. And our results aren't necessarily representative of worldwide patterns because the studies we glean from our systematic review are generally published in Western journals. And so likely represent our effect likely represents patterns from Western academia. And then we wanted to look at how the way in which research productivity was quantified, how that affects our effect size. So research productivity can be measured with publications and numbers of submissions and the numbers of female and male authors in those, or it can be measured by surveys. And we can see that our effect, the effect of the pandemic seems to be much greater in surveys um, with our mean score at minus 0 0.192. Um, and that may be because surveys kind of capture a more real-time effect compared to pub numbers of publications and submissions, which might take a long time for the effect of the pandemic to be reflected in. But surveys also may be flawed because they're subjective and people might have sort of self-serving biases when responding to the surveys. People might have issues with recall and memory and our population um, 
the population of respondents might be biased towards those who feel very strongly about the pandemic. There's also far fewer studies, survey studies, each with smaller samples because of the number of respondents in surveys. But when we look at the research productivity as measured by publications and submissions, the pandemic seems to have had less of an effect, but consistently around 5%. So this means that the gender gap increase has increased by 5% if we measure research productivity as publications and submissions. So before, where the women comprised 33.2% of authors, it's now 31.7% of authors are women. Um, um, the issue with publications and submissions is that gender here is inferred on for using first names, which again, assumes a cisgender sort of binary variable as gender. And I'm not sure how well it can infer gender in this way using non-Western names. We also looked at the effects of uh, research fields. So for publications and submissions, so these are called article studies. We group them into whether they fell into social sciences, medicine, multidisciplinary, so that could be any mixture of all of these, biological sciences, and technology, engineering, mathematics, chemistry, and physics. And we found that social sciences and in medicine, the pandemic had the greatest effect on the gender gap in uh, research productivity, possibly because of the surge in publications related to COVID-19, so the surge in medicine-related articles, and in research related to pandemics, so in social sciences. So this surge of publications in social science and medicine potentially might have further exacerbated this, gen this gender gap in research productivity. And then when we grouped so these research fields based on the previous gender gap, which is which we which we use the proportion of female authors in these fields as a proxy for, we found that fields which were nearest gender equal actually worsened the most. So that's mostly in social sciences, medicine, and in multidisciplinary fields. So there's potentially a regression in um, trying to establish gender equality. Um, when we tried to investigate the effect of um, how different authorship roles were affected by the pandemic, we found only a clear effect on first authorship roles. But it's hard to draw meaningful conclusions from this because our sample sizes are unequal. Actually, half of our effect sizes lie in first authorship. So this might have increased the probability of first authorship roles um, being affected most by the pandemic. And um, really to conclude, we show that the pandemic has increased the gender gap in academic productivity by performing this um, systematic review and meta-analysis, collating these studies. Our review doesn't investigate causal mechanisms for this effect. We can only draw to um, literature previously done on gender roles in academia and from anecdotal reports of women be infected by the, um, by the pandemic. Um, nevertheless, we think it's still important to reconsider how we use research productivity when evaluating academic merit. And we think our study is important because the code that's made available can be used to monitor long-term trends. So for example, in publications and submissions where we might see the effect of the pandemic in later years, this analysis can be repeated as more and more research gets published. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Um, thank you to my supervisors during this. Um, and thank you to the studies for making all of their data and effect sizes available for us to use in our research. Um, I leave my email here at the bottom in case you'd like to contact us about our research. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kieran, for sharing with you your scientific insights. That was again quite impressive five years ago. Such a presentation would not have been possible simply because at that point in time we did not um, like scientific.
scientifically exploring and investigate open science. This apparently has changed five years ago. We were more addressing uh, um, uh, open science policies, what needs to be done to, uh, um, uh, yeah, to, to push forward the movement. Um, Again, uh, same question to you as to the uh, first speaker. So you are a um, biologist. Uh, so that is your field of uh, research, I would guess. Um, uh, now you are doing research in the field of open science, investigating how uh, um, the gender gap uh, increased. Where would you publish it? I mean, where would you go for publications? Would that be a typical publication which fits to journals or conferences of your scientific discipline? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so we looked for journals which had published similar sort of data before, and um, we are currently work publishing with eLife because they've done research. With, they have a strain of journals called Meta Research, um, and we've made every, all of our code available, and it's a journal which. Um, everyone can access. Um, so, yeah, um, I confess this is my first experience of publishing. So I'm still learning about a lot of open science practices. But as I learn, I mean, kind of realizing our choices and how they affect our research and how it gets accessible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on your last slide, uh, you mentioned that um, you did not investigate any casual um, uh, mechanisms, so reasons why this has changed. Uh, still, do you have an idea, uh, even though it might not scientifically be proved at this point in time, but that I think could be interesting uh, to all of us? Yeah, so that's um, something we can't discuss fully, um, but we can point towards research where women um, compared to men have to undertake more non-promotable tasks in academia um, and in the home place there are potentially gender roles and unconscious biases where women have different roles compared to men mm. um, and the pandemic presents potentially a unique circumstance where there was this surge of publications and this surge might have really exposed the gender gap and those processes happening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kieran. I, I wish you all the success you need to accomplish your uh, thesis. And I hope that um, no further pandemic will uh, come to further, you know, um, uh, to, to further kind of uh, disturb you in your research. Thank you very much for sharing with us your thoughts, your um, um, scientific insights, and hopefully see you again uh, um, in one of the upcoming Open Science Conferences. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you very much. We now come to our next speaker, and for the next speaker we go to France, uh, to uh, the University um, Claude Bernard in Lyon. Our speaker will be Alejandra Manco, and she will be talking about open science policies f seen from the perspective of a basic science researcher's community. So she will look at, well, what is needed from a perspective of a basic researcher uh, with regard to open science policies. I think she's already there. There's Alejandra. Hi. Ale Yandra, nice to meet you there. Are you in Lyon at this point in time? Yes. You are, okay. Um, she is a PhD candidate in information and communication sciences at the Lyon University. She is also a PhD candidate performing her PhD thesis dealing with open science policies and the effects of these policies on basic researchers' careers. Alejandra, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will start uh, sharing the screen. Can you see it? Just wait a few seconds. We have some delay. Now there it is. Yeah. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm Alejandra Manco, I'm a PhD student at the Université Claude Bernard Lyon 1, uh, part of the ELICO team, which is the um, Information and Communication Research Team of Lyon. Uh, so, as everybody knows, open science policies have been implemented worldwide uh, on an international, national, and institutional level. Uh, but there is still a research gap uh, in understanding how these policies are affecting uh, researchers' knowledge production practices. So, the uh, research question uh, for this presentation is uh, how have open science policies impacted the knowledge product production process practices of researchers' communities working in the basic science? Uh, in this case, uh, physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, as for the method, I used um, a qualitative research, in this case, transnational qualitative research, because the interviews were to researchers working in France, Peru, and Brazil, in the three areas mentioned, physics, biology, and chemistry. And as for the data collection stages, I use a ranking um, as uh, to identify the universities in each country where uh, researchers are currently working. And uh, after this identification process, uh, I proceed to contact the scientists using social media like LinkedIn, Twitter, and, uh, and interview them if they agree, if they have time. And uh, also, I, I work with the interview transcriptions uh, using a qualitative software, and then the coding process for the interviews was conducted using a thematic analysis with inductive category development approach. Um, as for the results, um, well, I, even though there are various uh, knowledge production formats uh, uh, now, uh, the article format is still the most commonly used. So it is uh, important uh, to establish credibility and peer recognition in these three communities, even though some uh, researchers feel that this is a uh, tradition, traditional article format, it's a bit outdated and not okay for alternative formats of uh, scientific communication. So, for example, this uh, person working in the physics area argues that uh, I know that uh, there are open science platforms, but has been unable to publish in these uh, open science platforms because it needs to publish in its only a specific journals. And uh, that scientific communication is really slowed down by words. Uh, so probably it would be a good idea to find alternative media for this. As for openness, overall, researchers across disciplines and countries support open science. So it's a very positive uh, opinion about this. And uh, mostly in between three areas, uh, open access, uh, open research data, and open codes. Uh, open access uh, has, uh, uh, has a component in the updating the theoretical frameworks, uh, avoid duplicating previous research and uh, check if the research questions have already been answered or uh, formulate uh, price, precise uh, research questions or better define the objectives. As for open research data and open codes, this helps with the reproducibility of research. Um, open science so far has facilitated uh, collaboration and communication among the scientists uh, uh, using um, two strategies uh, to establish initial contacts and then engage in discussions through open science platforms. And uh, also in open access, the direct access to authors and manuscripts in haste communication and knowledge exchange. And it's also very, very positive on the feedback on the work uh, because researchers receive comments and suggestions that can improve their work. And it also peers from different fields uh, contributed with valuable insights. That's in, that means that uh, there is um, better transdisciplinary research. And of course, there is increased uh, visibility of research through feedback and circulation between the community. Um, however, there are some issues also uh, between the division of labor in transnational teams that uh, reinforces existing inequalities, particularly in North-South collaborations. Uh, researchers from developing countries are often limited to data collection or technical tasks, lacking involvement in the design and analysis of the research. 
and this is uh, because our local researchers' capacities are underestimated, perpetuating a hierarchy in knowledge production. And also, this contributes that international collaborations uh, create a competitive environment as uh, researchers compete with uh, other universities worldwide. Um, there's, of course, the emphasis of being the first to publish uh, an idea. And uh, in this case, uh, preprint uh, servers reinforce these competitive behaviors, as one research put it, uh, puts it. Uh, preprints are very useful to a tool to put an idea on the market first uh, before uh, somebody else that could be working in the same idea in some other country does it. And um, the pressure to be the first to, with the new ideas ident identifies competitions uh, among scientists leading to conflicts between collaboration and individual ambition. Um, education and previous negative experience also contributed to these competitive behaviors within the scientific community, uh, suggesting the needs uh, for a systemic change in the research culture. Uh, similarly, open research data, while it's very beneficial for scientific prog progress, can also ex exacerbate competition if other colleagues uh, analyze a, and publish a paper before the original researcher, who could be the data creator in this case. Uh, so, for example, the, this person says, uh, I was too slow to work with the data, so somebody else published it before me, because at that time I was not uh, motivated, so it was too slow. And uh, about the competition, there are so also ethical and even research misconduct issues. So, uh, for example, the potential scooping of ideas, data, and even possible authorships, um, especially from other colleagues working with uh, more prominent and better equipped uh, laboratories or with a faster computer infrastructure. As we have seen in this conference, science is still very uh, prestige-based, so it's very important who is the PI, uh, where is the, which is the laboratory, where is located this laboratory. All these things uh, matter a lot. Uh, and um, about uh, open science practices and institutional policies, generally, um, I have found that uh, there is a lack of awareness of about institutional policies uh, prevalent across the res researchers. Um, so there is a very vague idea of, uh, yes, there is a policy, but uh, exactly what does it entail when, when it was published, who published? Um, um, no, no, people don't, don't really know much about it. Uh, so in a way, the communities uh, encourage and practice open science. So we can say that it's uh, self-regulation of the practices. And this also means that uh, this lack of awareness could indicate that the researchers are not consulted in the policy making. And uh, when asked, uh, what do you think an open science policy should contain? Um, there are two uh, priorities emerging in this sense. Uh, one is effective internal communication in the laboratories and uh, collaboration guidelines. And as for field specificities in open science practices, uh, in the area of physics, uh, open science practices are very ingrained. Uh, even so, that uh, researchers feel that there is no really is an unofficial open science policy is even unnecessary. And uh, this uh, community has a long-standing tradition of preprint sharing, which has influenced other disciplines in adopting this specific practice. Um, as for the chemistry community, it is observable that uh, there is a more conservative approach to open science practices. And as for the biology community, uh, there is the division of labor concerns about data collection tasks in North-South collaborations, even though there are already ethical guidelines um, on this. So, um, Thank you so much uh, for listening, and if you have any questions or comments, I will be happy to answer those. Thank you very much, Alejandra.
Thank you very much for sharing your uh, um, insights with us. I would like to invite the auditorium uh, to post their questions into the interaction tool. You have here the uh, URL and the access code. Um, one question I would like to ask you relates to the uh, like focus of the open science policies. Um, we have been involved in uh, the design, uh, creation, evaluation of several of such policies, and they might be completely different in terms of focus. Some focus are focusing on internal processes, internal communication. Others are focusing on well, how to uh, um, uh, behave as a uh, researcher, whether you should, for example, be um, an editor of a uh, subscripted uh, journal or whether you should publish only in open access journals. So there are huge differences in the, uh, um, in the, in the um, yeah, of the focus of uh, the open science policy. What is your um, impression? To what extent might this have impacted the results of your outcome? Or did you choose um, open science policies of like the same kind or the same type? Uh, yes. Um, I observed that uh, in the three countries, so, so in France, Brazil and Peru, uh, the open science policies in place so usually uh, have to do with uh, research outputs. So open access or uh, open data. The, these votes are the main components, and they are very similar, <laughs> after all, yes. In, uh, so. Okay, in your case, uh, the um, uh, open science policies were um, like of the same kind. We have one question um, uh, from the audience, and here it is. We can all read it. Did you also research the connection between which languages researchers publish in the researched countries? Ah, yes, this is very interesting. Um, well, it, I didn't uh, uh, ask this question, uh, but uh, it is, uh, I have the impression that uh, since these are uh, areas that uh, are the same everywhere, um, <laughs> people prefer to publish in nature with the most known um, journals in these areas. Uh, but I think uh, this is uh, very interesting because this does not happen in other areas, for example, social science, but it, it is more interesting to publish in the local language, for oh. example. Okay. And also the international collaborations um, enhance this. So, for example, if it's a north-south collaboration, uh, they will most likely publish in, uh, in this kind of uh, prestige journals. Thank you very much. To me, it was very obvious that uh, the field of research is very closely related to the field of your PhD uh, thesis. You are a candidate in information and communication sciences, and what you have presented is uh, fitting perfectly uh, to this um, scientific domain. Um, there is another question uh, which is now displayed on the screen. Uh, thank you for your talk. Yes, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on why some fields are more resistant to open science while other fields are more welcoming of it. Yes, uh, I think the communities are self-regulating each other, um, as I said before. So um, this is very interesting and I think uh, it should be <laughs> studied further. Uh, Thank you very much, Alejandra. Thank you for your talk. And we will continue now with our next speaker. Our next speaker comes from Finland. It's Anna Kerki from the Satakunta University of Applied Sciences. And uh, she will be talking about the results of monitoring and open science and research in Finland. She will bring the perspective of the sector of universities of applied sciences. I think Anne is already around. There she is. Hi, Anne. Good Hi. to see you. We have a very loyal community from Finland <laughs> participating almost every year here in uh, the conference with the submissions, presentations, and I'm glad that we have yet another um, uh, community member from Finland. Where are you in, in Finland? Yes, I'm in the west coast of Finland, Pori, at the moment. Uh, we have a very sunny day today in the <laughs> University of Applied Sciences of Satakunta. 
How, how, how far north is it? I mean, I feel uh, north. It's not really. Not it's uh, about 200 kilometers from Helsinki. So okay. it's in the <laughs> middle of Finland. Yeah, but quite a distance from here. Okay. Yes. So Anne is involved in several research data infrastructure activities in her country, for example, related to um, open research data infrastructures in the University of Applied Sciences sector. She's also involved in open science monitoring activities. For example, she's responsible for the accessibility of open education resources in the country. And um, Anna, uh, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. So, in this short presentation, I will introduce you the results of uh, open science and research monitoring that was done uh, last year in Finland. And this monitoring shows us and you the long-term work re results that we have done. We don't uh, see so your slides yet. Um, uh, maybe oh, you, you really? wait a second. Uh, yeah, we don't see uh, them yet. Uh, let me try again. Also, Backstage is working on it. Stop sharing again. I will try again. How about now? Is it sharing now? We, we only see your browser, but not the slides. Let's see if I need to. Just do some trick with this. Move it to my own computer. It might help sometimes. Okay. Is it now working? We can see the PowerPoint here on backstage, and I think we will also be able to. Uh, Could you start it? Yeah, I tried to uh, yeah. open it now. Yeah, it yeah. Uh, we have some delay of 20 seconds. It should be uh, um, on the screen in a few seconds. There it is now. Um, yeah, okay. okay. So, sorry, I had so many screens, so it didn't share there. So, going through these monitoring results that we have done together, uh, collecting the data from the National uh, Data Bank of the monitoring. So, we are belonging to the Open RDI network, the researchers that are pointed out in this PowerPoint. So, some introduction. Uh, we have already had the Declaration of Open Science and Research since 2020. And this monitoring is meant to support the development of open science and research in organizations, universities and research organizations. And also to, to verify what kind of achievements have been made during this and after this Declaration 2020. So, it was carried out uh, the first time last year. It was in the way light and largely based on existing and well-known indicators that are also used in European monitoring. And in Finland, we pilot the indicators uh, through the Open Science and Research Network together with Finnish research communities. So, it was like a common agreement to do and use these indicators. And there were four areas that were built up and indicators were covering them. Culture of the open scholarship, open access to research data and methods, and open access to research publications. And then open education and educational resources that is not so new at the moment. So, this model describes how this was done. So, there was the basis, basic policy documents, collaboration, how it's done, the services, what they are, and what kind of outputs they can be already shown in this monitoring. And then there were these four areas that it was covering up. And totally, it com combined one overall assessment of every organization responding and participating to monitoring. And this was the online survey that was done. And then data was collected from some of the sources that could be found. 
And then, of course, also uh, there was uh, interviews or what we say surveys that were carried out in every organization participating. So the level five is the best level, and it meant that in every part of the profile, uh, the level should be 3.5 to reach at least three degree of three. Then the level four, you have to achieve three, and in every one of the areas could be two, and then three, and so on. So this was a bit more softer approach in the first time. Next time, I think we are more strict with this, this monitoring. So, and the results in University of Applied Sciences, I don't compare uh, us to other organizations. In Finland, there are 23 you know, uh, applied universities. And what we see is that none of these universities was any more in the level of one. So most of them achieved the level of five and four in the total counting. And then there were few in the level of two and few in the level of three. Culture and open scholarship. So this is something that we have some work to do. Uh, because part of the monitoring also affected the overall results. We, most of us were in the level of three and up that, but there were still some in the level of two. Um, that is something that one of the issues, for example, that was covered up was citizen science. That is not so clear in universities of applied sciences, how it should be done and is it done in these universities this during this monitoring period. Then data and infrastructure. So again, we were in the level quite nicely in the level of four and five, but we did not look about the open data sets in this monitoring. We looked how these practices are supported and how the advices are given and what kind of systems to open the data we have. So this is something that will come up next uh, from the year 24, when the next monitoring is done, then the data sets are also counted. Publications is something that we got a very good agree <laughs> assessment in here. And this is perhaps because uh, universities of applied sciences have used open publications already during their existence and it's increased all the time. Why didn't we get five is because we do not use parallel publishing because most of the publishing is open access it, through open access channels. So we still have something to do better in this way in future too. So open education. It's already developed quite well in some, but still there are a lot of work to do because there are some organizations in the level of one. And these results show that many organizations have willingness to open educational resources, I have willingness, but have not done it yet. Practices to open material are developed but the number of open educational resources is still quite a little in, in the universities of applied science. What then I could say about the monitoring uh, totally. So it seemed to be that we have worked quite well towards uh, the publications and some of the educational, open educational resources issues, but we have a lot of work to do in the overall and in when thinking that opening the data sets in future and looking forward the more more like open educational surroundings, how to use it too. But this is the, what I have to say in this this part now. Thank you.
Um, Anne, thank you very much. Um, the Nordic countries are always very advanced when it comes to open science. We have um, one question already from the audience. I would like to invite all of you to uh, uh, post your questions. And here it is. Are your activities related to those of the EOSC Observatory, a policy intelligence tool for monitoring policies, practices, impact related to the European Open Science Cloud? Yes, yes. All the monitoring uh, questions and the background was based also on EOSC. So, uh, because this is done by the uh, what we call it, an organization that runs in Finland the open, open policies and makes the publication and runs the work based on our ministry's funding. So we are working together with you closely. Yeah, I, I would have uh, had indeed a related question to that one, um, because um, as you know, there was, for example, the EOSC Nordic project, which tried to align the national open science policies in the Nordic countries. Now we have the CONOSC um, like yeah. initiative, which tries to align the uh, um, national open science policies of the member states with one another. Is your work somehow related to uh, these activities? Yes, uh, because uh, I know that because I'm not involved with the nas international mm -hmm. collaboration, but the Finnish organization who is running the monitoring is uh, combined with the Nordic countries too. So we are part of the agreements and we will apply them okay. in our own monitoring system. And uh, as I know that we have lots of these recommendations that we look the others, how mm. the others do and how yeah. we can change to, in the Finnish context, the same yeah. issues. Yeah. Alignment here is convergence of the existing open science policies. The national ones is very important for yeah. Europe. We have another question from the audience. Thank you for your talk. Have you published the methods of how you assessed and how open the works were? Yeah, there's the open data and when you have the material you can click the look the open data that is published and you can use and look the questions and it's both in English. English I think and Finnish and Swedish are the languages of the monitoring and the methods that we are used in Finland. Okay. Now the questions are already changing for the year of 24 because there were some that needed to be more focused but the basic collection will stay we have one last question from uh, the audience here it is your participants seem to need to submit rather detailed information via the survey are there incentives to share this information on open science on yeah, they they do. Uh, there are lots of discussions of how to share it and how to how the monitoring really is the truth of what is and what exists. So they are looked quite uh, exactly from the net pages. You have to have opened some of the data. You have to have the material and the guidance opened, so anybody outside can go and check it. They are willing because they wanted to participate in it. So everybody in the universities of our universities and the research organization participated in the monitoring. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to listen to presentations from Finland. You are very, very well positioned with the, um, in the context of open science. Um, thanks a lot, uh, and I hope to see you again at one of our upcoming open science conferences. And best regards to all your colleagues who certainly contributed to this important work. Thank you very much. We continue with the next talk coming from Germany. It will be held by Laura Rothfritz. She's from the Humboldt University in Berlin. And she will be talking about uh, trust and risks in infrastructures, not infrastructures as a whole, certain infrastructures, PID infrastructures, infrastructures for persistent identifiers, I assume. And I think Laura is already around. <laughs> there she is. Hello, Laura. I guess you are in Berlin, right? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. So she's a PhD candidate at the Department of Information Management at the School for Library and Information Science at Humboldt University. Congratulations for having been accepted as PhD candidate for all of uh, you who are not from Germany. That is certainly, uh, I would say, the uh, most famous and prestigious um, uh, institute for information management and <laughs> library science in Germany. And it's certainly a, a uh, great recognition that you are doing uh, your PhD there. So her uh, research interests are in the area of research data management, infrastructure studies and open science. And uh, the topic of her dissertation is distrust and mistrust in data infrastructures. Laura, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. I hope you can all see my screen. Oh yeah, I can see that you can see my screens. Um, so today I am going to talk about risk and trust in PID infrastructures. Um, I have two heads on right now. So I am from Berlin and I am at the EB right now. So at the School of Library and Information Science, but I conducted this study together with my colleagues from Society Good Science Consulting, um, which is my kind of side hustle uh, job. Um, but um, all of my all of my research interests are basically in the same area. And so both of these go together really well. Um, this study was um, commissioned by Knowledge Exchange. Knowledge Exchange is a collaboration between six European countries. Um, the Netherlands, Finland, France, Denmark, Germany, the UK and the Netherlands, I think I already said that. Um, and they wanted to find out um, what a well functioning, functioning PID infrastructure for these countries and beyond that could look like. Um, they wanted us to emphasize on the topics of risk and trust, um, which of course I found very interesting because um, I do a lot of trust research, um, which also contains risk research um, and because my research topic is distrust, I already I also know a lot about trust. Um, so this um, study took about about a year, and we did um, a literature study, about eighteen expert interviews. Um, we wrote seven case studies, a pretty large report, which you can see here, and which is I would recommend. Um, I'm biased, but I would recommend you to read. Um, and this report also contains certain recommendations. Today, because I only have 10 minutes, I will be talking about the main topics, risk and trust. I will not be talking about the recommendations or the case studies. I will highlight two of them very quickly at the end of the presentation. But all of this you can find online. Um, it's about 150 pages um, of content. So let's see what I can talk about in maybe eight minutes I have left. So um, risk and trust. Risk and trust especially if you're talking about trusting an infrastructure is kind of hard to study because especially for infrastructures, um, trustworthiness or trust in infrastructures, you can't really pinpoint what part of an infrastructure people trust in. So for example, for PID infrastructures, do people um, trust in the technology? Do people trust in organizations? Um, are there any other parts or topics um, concerning PIDs that people trust in? Um, so what we did is um, we did expert interviews and we kind of coded those interviews deductively. Um, we looked at the most common factors or aspects of trustworthiness, um, one for organizations um, and two for technology. And then on the, we found the most common, uh, common um, risk topics um, that we analyzed. And then we thought, okay, Let's see which topics are the most important for people that we talk to, and let's see um, how these work together to form trusting behavior or trust. It depends on what you want to call us. Some people call it risk-taking behavior because risk is very important to trust. Without risk, trust would not be necessary. Um, what we found in very short is that these uh, topics or these aspects I, I highlighted on this um, slide were the most important um, for the experts we talked to. Um, you can see actually, even though PID systems and PIDs are in nature kind of technical, so you know it's something that happens very technical, um, but actually trustworthiness in technology 
was pretty high and also not super important to people. What was really important was the organizations and especially risks in terms of political and social risks, um, which I will highlight. What we found in general is that the one of the biggest risks right now is a kind of high fragmentation in the landscape, in the PID landscape. So we have lots of PIDs, um, PIDs for all kinds of objects, all kinds of things in the research or in the scholarly communication, um, but um, also because some PIDs and because all PIDs obviously cost money to maintain, um, this might result in a lack of resources. Um, so we have to see how we can deal with these kinds of fragmentations. Um, on the other hand, interview said, okay, um, there's also a risk of centralization. This is a common risk for any infrastructure or any service in scholarly communication. And um, interviewees really highlighted that they didn't want any kind of centralization for PRD infrastructures. Um, another risk is a high dependency on organizations. We all know, okay, there are certain organizations like data site, like Crossref, for example, that offer PRD services. Um, and if you get PRDs um, from those um, organizations, you are very dependent on them. Um, I also added sometimes people on this slide because they are obscure, very small um, um, identifiers used in very small communities, which are basically run on some guy's server in his attic or something. And this is not a metaphor. This is really um, true. So um, all, everything is dependent on this one guy and his server for this kind of PID. Um, another big risk is, of course, lack of community uptake. So if you have, you can have the best infrastructure in the world, the best PID system in the world, if people don't use it, it's worthless. Um, really interesting was that when I talked to people about inter-organizational or intra-organizational contingency plans, so fallback plans, what happens if, um, for example, Crossref has a big outage and nothing works, um, people kind of were surprised by the question and didn't really know how to answer because these kinds of plans were mostly not in place. Other risks are, of course, like every scholarly infrastructure, financial sustainability, um, and this is always true. Um, I want to finish risks by highlighting that um, a lot of people said um, that um, PIDs are overestimated. So PIDs are overestimated. PIDs are seen as kind of trust markers, quality stamps, the holy grail, some people said uh, in scholarly communica communication as the solver for all problems. Um, but if you overestimate PIDs and you put, you put all your trust into PIDs um, and don't think about risk, then this is a problem. In general, if we talk about trust, PIDs are social or socio-technical um, infrastructures. So it's super important to care about people. It's not just technology, it's mostly people. Um, and people tend to trust in other people or organizations or people who represent organizations. The technical infrastructure is not that important to them. The people are. Um, and trust can be achieved by transparency, for example, that gives users, PID users, a feeling of control. I say feeling of control because feeling is really important here. Um, doesn't mean they actually have control because this is not possible, but if they feel they are in control, they trust a service more. And structural assurance like contracts, policies, risk management workforce, et cetera, also build trust. Um, reputation is another really important topic. Um, the organization is supposed to have a good relationship with its user community. Um, we know Crossref and Datasite, for example, do a lot of um, user-centric um, workshops and surveys, for example. Um, an organization is supposed to have really clear values. Um, so what do they want? How are they going to achieve it? And a willingness to invest and commit to an identifier system. I'm going to wrap up now, but here are my clear or my, my, my very important uh, takeaway messages. Um, I want to stress that PIDs are not magic. Um, PIDs are super important for scholarly communication. Um, they are great. They work great uh, in most parts, but they are not by themselves trust markers. They are not quality stems. They should not be overestimated. Um, it is not cheap 
or easy to maintain the PID infrastructures. Um, and the magic that PIDs are um, could not happen without the people around it. So it takes a village, of course. Um, and trust is good, of course, but blind, blind trust is um, not good at all. So it is really important to talk about risks also. Um, risks are something that are not necessarily talked about with PIDs a lot, but it's really important to think about it. And um, my last uh, point I want to make, and this is um, the horse I will not get down from, is um, that trustworthiness or trustworthy is not the same as trusted. So, for example, if PID providers describe themselves as trustworthy, it does not mean they are trusted. Um, and you as a PID provider, how would you know, for example, that you are actually trusted if you um, describe yourself as trustworthy? This is not a question that's easy to answer for our PID providers, by the way. Um, just a quick view, these two case studies, if you're interested in risk and trust and PID infrastructures, these two case studies are, um, I think, most illustrative. One's about failed PIDs, um, Perl, for example, almost failed. One is about IGSN, which is a community-run PID, um, which has a lot of trust from its user community. And I'm going to wrap up now. Um, if you want to keep in touch, um, you can see my contact information on the screen. I'm always happy to talk about um, PRDs um, and everything else. I know this is kind of a nerdy topic in general, but um, I like to talk about nerdy stuff. And you know, studying an infrastructure, um, Susan B. Star once said, um, I like to study boring things and I guess um, it's the same for me. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Thank you very much um, uh, um, uh, for your presentation. I would like again to invite um, our participants to post their questions on Slido. We already have one question uh, there and maybe we can show it on the screen. And here it is. Thank you. Many factors for success for trustful infrastructures grow over time. How do you get on a successful path setting up a trustworthy infrastructure? Yep, this is uh, this is a good question. Um, I think so. I can I can talk from my perspective and how I view infrastructures. I think starting bottom up is very important if you want your community to be involved. Um, a good example for this is IGSN, which I just uh, which I just showed, which is an identifier for I think um, geology samples or started as an identifier for geology samples, really out of the community. And it was there was a clear need. Um, people started it basically also in their own bedroom, and now they um, they are part of data sites, so they really were successful, and um, they maintain trust by just keeping keep on going, listening to the community, um, opening up um, their proceedings and their organization, and really trying to cater to the community needs. And I think. Um, the most important part is that you have your community on board, because if you if you just if you build an infrastructure without an actual need and without community involvement, um, the infrastructure, like I said, can be the best infrastructure in the world, but um, it's not it's not really usable. Thank you very much. We have another question from our participants. Um, here it is. Have you researched and identify any disciplinary differences in terms of of perceived risks? <laughs> this is a super cool question. Um, I wish I had. Um, unfortunately, we did not have the time to do this. Um, this is actually a question um, that um, I've been thinking about in terms of my PhD um, research. Um, I don't study trust, I study distrust, you know, but uh, it's not, it's not two, it's two very different things, but um, both are connected to risks. Um, for this research, um, especially uh, around PIDs, um, we did not have the time for this. Um, I think also if you talk about uh, disciplinary, disciplinary differences, you also need to talk about the different kinds of users. Um, because in the PID infrastructure, there are, of course, end users, you know, people who cite stuff, but there are also kind of middle level, mid level users, so repositories. Um, PID managers, um, funders, um, journal providers, and things like that. And they use um, PIDs very differently from end users, let's call them this. Um, 
So I think it's not only about disciplinary differences, but about user roles as well. And, and this we actually studied. So if you're interested in this, you can read the report. Um, there's lots about that in there. Okay, we have a final question from the audience. Laura, did your work cover use of PIDs at a very granular level below the article unit? So for example, so yeah, so um, uh, I know what you mean. Um, I know about this and we um, talked about this and we wrote a little bit about, about this. And I think one of the case studies is um, more about this, um, but the general report is not, um, it's not about how PIDs work. It's how, PR, how, how PIDs function in the scholarly community. Um, and this is um, why we did, not, we did not describe certain PID systems or compare certain PID, PID systems in functionality, for example. But we were looking at how, in general, PID systems um, work um, in, in, in the scholarly community. Um, and this is why we did not really go super granular. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I will wish you all the best for the successful completion of your PhD at Humboldt University. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Hopefully we we'll see each other again at uh, another occasion here in Germany. Thank we you. We come to our next uh, and the last talk of uh, this morning's uh, session. It will be uh, given by Aya Besin from Bielefeld University, also here in Germany. And she will be talking on uh, um, uh, code sharing policies and the impact of uh, code sharing policies on code ab availability. I think Aya is already around. There she is. Hi, Aya. Hi. 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 I assume you are in Bielefeld, aren't you? Exactly, I'm in exactly. Bielefeld. Okay. You are also uh, working in a field which is kind of connected to open science, but not really in open science. It's bioinformatics. Exactly. And uh, you're a student there at the uh, University of Bielefeld. And currently you are working on a meta research project focusing on code data sharing policies in ecology, right? Now, the floor is yours. Please um, start with your presentation, Aya. Thank you so much. Um, so my presentation, thank you firstly for joining me today. So my presentation will try uh, to answer if journal code sharing policies increase code av availability. This work is comparison between ecological journals with and without code sharing policies. So today's journey will uh, include several key points. Firstly, I'll start with my introduction, setting the stage with a detailed look at code sharing in the field of ecology. Secondly, I will outline the specific goal of our study. This will be followed by an overview uh, of our methodology, including our data collection and analysis methods. Afterwards, I will unfold our findings and to conclude, providing some recommendation and take home messages from our study. So yeah, so one of the fundamental aspects of modern research involves writing code to process data, conduct statistical analysis, and sti simulate models. Making this code publicly available helps others to understand the analysis, evaluate the study's conclusion, uh, reuse the code for future analysis, and it increases overall research reproducibility. So we remark there is increasing trend of journal adapting guidelines or establishing policies that require or encourage authors to publicly share the code underlying their findings. Uh, from our sample of 96 ecological journals, we saw a remarkable growth in the adoption of such policies. So in 2015, we had only 15 uh, of these journals with mandatory or encouraged uh, code sharing policies. By 2020, this number has risen dramatically to 75%, which is pretty good. But 
Three years ago, uh, Colleen and al. Uh, conducted a study on code uh, availability in ecological journals. They analyzed about 400 papers from 14 journals that either had a mandatory code sharing policy or explicitly encouraged authors to share their code. So their findings reveal that about 73% of the papers provided no code, 5% uh, of them did not provide the code and one, just 1% one did not make their, to, their, uh, their data available. This meant that only 21% of the papers in these journal, journals could be reproduced. So our research this time aims to build up in this, in this study. So we'll specifically investigate the impact of code sharing policies on code availability in ecological journals. So starting with our methods, um, we had in our uh, data pool 20, uh, 12 journals that do not mention code or anything that can be interpreted as a code in their policies. And then and from these 12, we extracted about tw uh, 200 papers published in two distinct uh, periods from June 2015 to December 2016 and from January 2018 to May 2019. And then we started screening using uh, Ryan, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Here we go. And then uh, we started uh, screening these papers using the software Ryan. Oh my God. Okay. Um, to meet our inclusion criteria, uh, a paper had to conduct a statistical analysis, develop uh, and run mathematical method, or conduct simulation. Thus, we included the reviews, so op uh, opinions and purely bioinformatics papers uh, are excluded. So, and the screening was done by two reviewers. Uh, at the end, we were left with 314 papers that were relevant for data extraction. And then we conducted our final step, which is obviously data extraction. So we gathered information on 14 variables. Um, to make sure that our Ryan screening was accurate, we identified again whether the paper included statistical analysis and simulations, and whether it had bioinformatics analysis. And then the names of, uh, we extracted the names of the software tools used in the analysis along with their versions, uh, and we also did the same with the packages. Furthermore, we checked if the paper shared the code or and data, and if so, where they were shared, providing the corresponding link. So, coming to our... I'm not sure, okay. Uh, so, where are we now? Uh, looking to our results for papers from journals without code sharing policies, we find that in the first time frame, 97% of these papers did not share and the chart did not share any code. This percentage dropped slightly to 91% uh, in the second period. Further, only 1.9% of journals shared their complete data in the first period, and this uh, figured experience a slight increase. We can see it uh, in the uh, between 2018-2019. This trends in our uh, study stand in a contrast uh, to those found in the previous paper. So where 23% uh, of papers with code policies share their code in 2015-2016, and this figure increased to 30% uh, to 2018-2019. So practically, we can say that code share policies can increase uh, the sharing of code. Uh, and as previously I mentioned, we also tracked whether the papers made their data available. So this is illustrated in this figure. We can see that only 14 of papers shared their, their data in the first period, but the number rose to 30, about 33 in the second period. Meanwhile, around 70% of the paper did not share shared any data, but this number decreased uh, to 56 in the second period. So these figures uh, provide an interesting contrast to the previous study, which uh, found that almost 80% of papers shared their data. So we can also say that coding, code, sharing, poli uh, code policies can increase the, pub uh, the publishing of data. 
So now we can update our last figure where, by adding our new data. So according to the original data, it was found that 73% uh, of the journals did not provide any code. However, our new data reveals a significant increase uh, in this percentage. Now we are standing about 95.2%. Furthermore, the proportion of journals that did not provide the complete uh, code used uh, has decreased from 5% to just 1.6%. In terms of the availability of uh, data in the rest of the paper, the previous percentage of 1% is now 0.6%. So we are like, there is a huge difference. We can see it uh, through, through these numbers. Regarding reproducibility, and the original study reported that just to, that about 21% of the originals with code, um, its policies were able to achieve reproducibility. However, our last data shows a, a decline in this percentage with only 2.5% of the journals now remaining reproducible. So we can say that this result highlight the lack of code sharing practices in journals without explicit code sharing policies. Um, our primary recommendations for journalists is to establish uh, explicit code policies and it profoundly impacts, as we saw, uh, code sharing uh, practices enhancing reproducibility and transparency. In fact, at least some ecological journals, such as Ecology, uh, Ecology Letters, American Naturalist, and Journal of Evolutionary Biology, have included data and code editors in their additional uh, editor teams to furthermore, like, promote open science practices. Secondly, we can recommend that uh, journalists should imply or they can implement st uh, strict mechanisms to ensure researchers comply with code sharing requirements, like including conducting through uh, code reviews and verifying code av availability. In addition, um, we can say that, or we recommend that journals should provide uh, comprehensive support and resources to facilitate code sharing. This can involve offering platforms or repository for, K uh, for code uh, storage, uh, promoting open source software, organizing workshops and training sessions. Um, furthermore, actively promoting the benefits of code sharing is our as our recommendations to so uh, maybe journals should proactively educate researchers about the advantages and impact of sharing code in scientific research to conclude out my presentation i have like some key uh, notes uh, take note take home note messages so um code sharing is on the rise but requires improvement uh, implementing explicit code sharing policies is crucial however adherence to these uh, policies remain a challenge um, we can support have by having strict enforcement uh, of policies uh, actively promoting of code sharing benefits uh, can uh, can uh, ensure uh, and maintain better code sharing practices. This work is actually done by four of us, uh, Alfredo, me from Bielefeld University, Maria and Tisha from Croatia, and yeah, thank you so for listening and if you have any questions and feedbacks. Thank you very much for that interesting uh, presentation. Since I'm a computer scientist, I was um, uh, yeah very much um, um, yeah, impressed by, by the outcomes of your uh, research. A question I have is, um, if you talk about uh, code sharing and code sharing policies, does this also imply that the code has to be published under an open license? Because, you know, I could also provide the code to the journal, to the journal without um, adding an open license so the journal can use it but not the community. So how is the relationship between uh, um, uh, the sharing yeah. and the open licenses? Yeah, exactly. So to maintain the open source and the open side thing, we need to make sure that the code is actually uh, open uh, source and available to everyone, not just the journalist editor, but to every reader and every research from the community. Thank you. We have a question from uh, our participants. Um, here it is. Um, very interesting. To your knowledge, 
have similar results been identified for other disciplines than ecology? Uh, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so actually, our work is for ecological. Since we are from uh, ecological biology background, I'm not sure how um, the results in other disciplines. But I can say that in bioinformatics or in computer science is more or less uh, better than in bio, bio ecological biology. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. I think there is no further question from uh, the auditorium. Um, I would have one a final yeah. question from me. Um, if you apply for funding, you know, um, it's often required that you publish software code with an open license. And the question is, um, isn't that enough for improving, uh, increasing the code availability? So why is it necessary that the journals also have to implement a policy if the funders already implemented such a policy in their f um, uh, funding programs? Uh, I think this is, uh, this is important for, not for just for the funders or for, uh, for the journals, it's important for us as uh, young scientists to reproduce the results. So it's not just for, for them as editors, mm -hmm. but for us who are learning and who are trying to study the, uh, the methods to reproduce the results. So it's important in, in both ways. Okay, I think we have a final question. Um, here it is. Any core relationship of the journal studied with uh, whether they are indexed in the top factor? Transparency and openness promotion. I think it, I think it is. Uh, and the previous paper, uh, it's, um, uh, it's already proven that the uh, fact factor has, is, uh, uh, is related with code, uh, with open science uh, with code policies sharing but for for this paper we act we don't have any results so far about this thank you very much yeah. Aya. greetings to bielefeld and uh, best regards to your colleagues also in croatia thank, thank you. you this was the closing uh, talk of uh, the highlight talks uh, the insights into uh, um, uh, like research and meta-research uh, findings. We enter now a lunch break lasting until uh, 2 o'clock and then we, we reconvene here for the closing panel discussion. See you again at 2 o'clock, 14 hours this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>